Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt, and I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Um, I'd like to welcome you today to our call webinar, Digitizing Audio Cassette Collections for Preservation and Access at UPEI's Robertson Library. Um, I would first like to uh, just uh, let folks know that we are recording this session, or this webinar. Uh, the recording will be posted to the call uh, webinars page and also to the call YouTube channel after, shortly after the session is over. It should be up by this afternoon. Uh, I will send a message out to everybody who registered to let you know when that uh, recording is available. Uh, and also the slide deck, uh, which uh, I'll have Kelty send me after we also post that. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. We do ask that you uh, turn off your video and keep your mic muted uh, during the webinar, unless you're asking a question. Um, we do that just because we do have folks coming in from uh, low bandwidth areas. So we uh, want to make sure we optimize the experience for everybody. Um, and so uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that CALL CBPA represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the uh, unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, we acknowledge that the lands on which campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of Newfoundland and Labrador. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulastiwiak and the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude uh, to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, I'm going to turn the session over now to uh, Donald Moses, who is the university librarian at the University of Prince Edward Island, um, and he will be moderating the session and he will also be introducing uh, Kelty. Donald. Thanks, Cynthia. Good morning, folks. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Kelty McPhail. Kelty has been the Community History Librarian at the Robertson Library uh, since 2021 and has held uh, a number of different roles uh, prior to that. Uh, she's also the liaison librarian for the Faculty of Business, and her professional practice includes the management of the library's digitization lab and all the workflows associated with the work of the lab. She has trained and mentored many student assistants and has experienced digitizing a variety of analog materials from early indenture documents, cemetery maps, original manuscripts, uh, newspapers, magazines, photographs, letters, and AV material in its many forms. Uh, today, Kelty is going to share her experience related to her work digitizing audio cassettes at the Robertson Library. Thanks, Kelty. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Donald. Um, so yes, hello everybody. I'm very excited to be uh, sharing some of our experiences um, and some of our approaches that we've taken over the last few years um, to digitize specifically audio cassette material. Uh, just a quick note, um, I have kind of set the set session up so there is time for a bit of discussion or question at the end if people are interested. But as we go through, if there is something kind of really pressing that either maybe I glossed over too quickly or you want reiterated or do have a question about, uh, feel free to either raise your hand or pop something uh, in the chat uh, if it can't wait till the end. Uh, so uh, with that, we will get started. Um, so obviously there's lots of analog audio formats out there. Um, and many of which are in fairly dire need of preservation. But for today, I am going to focus on audio cassette material, uh, as that's where the bulk of, uh, of my experience lies. And that seems to have been where a lot of our focus has been on the projects we've done in the past here at Robertson Library. Uh, just a quick note, I am not by any means an audio tech expert. Um, so this session today, I'll kind of touch on some of the kind of technical details and approaches we take, but largely this is going to be sort of an overview of, of our approach and, and how we think about a lot of this, this work that we're doing. Uh, happy to share what we've learned. Um, also have a few things that we're trying to improve upon. A few things I realized we may need to improve upon as I was uh, preparing for this webinar. So it's been kind of a learning experience in a lot of different ways. Uh, so 
just before we get too deep into anything else, I do just want to take um, a second to acknowledge the uh, the team that we have here um, at the Robertson Library. We're very lucky to have a full digitization lab um, and a systems analyst team that help us do this work. Um, so all of the projects, the workflows, the processes, the work that's being done that I'm talking about today uh, is very much a collaborative effort, and we would not be able to do any of the work that we're doing um, without this team. So it's a great group of library technicians, systems analysts, um, one of whom is kind of our dedicated digitization technician um, and who is a musician and kind of an audio sort of wizard himself um, and is often my go-to for a lot of technical questions. Um, and then also our archivist and special collections librarian, Simon Lloyd, is heavily involved in a lot of these projects as well. And then of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of the work without several cohorts of very dedicated uh, student assistants who end up doing a lot of that day-to-day -day digitization work and uh, have their hands on a lot of the actual material itself. So just so we know, it's not just me as the librarian, there's a lot of people that go into making this happen. Uh, the first thing I kind of want to talk about is how we approach what we're going to digitize and what we're going to prioritize. There's lots of con tent out there, probably more than we could ever ever even think of, of managing. And so how we kind of make some of those decisions about, about what gets, gets the preservation treatment and the access treatment. Um, so just to touch on a few main things that we consider when we're making these decisions, um, and I'll sort of touch on each of these a little bit more in detail in a moment, um, is obviously um, preservation is a big one. Um, access, um, and that's both in the context of access as a preservation tool, but also providing access to facilitate research and open up areas of research that might not uh, have happened otherwise if things weren't available online. Uh, and then lastly, uh, community partnerships um, is a really big one for us, is what is the community interested in and what groups have come forward or connections that we have that do have content that is in need of preservation. And then to all of that, I will add probably the biggest caveat or uh, asterisk in the world that um, workload and capacity kind of sometimes unfortunately trumps all of this. You can have all of the preservation concerns and access goals in the world, but if you don't have the staffing or the time or the resources to do it, sometimes that is actually the most, the most pressing uh, criteria that we think about, unfortunately. Um, even with the team that we have, uh, we have staffing, staffing issues and workload capacity issues sometimes as well. So uh, to dig into preservation a little bit, um, and again, some of this stuff is going to be very similar if you've worked with print digitization, but there are some audio considerations we'll touch on as well. Um, obviously, all analog audio formats fall out of in and out of fashion, often out. It's very rare that they come back in. Uh, vinyl, I think, is maybe a bit of an exception to that. Um, and these all fall out of playability uh, much quicker than a print source will. 300 years from now, we probably can open up a book um, and still read it fairly easily may do a bit of damage to the item, but it is still conceivable that we could access the information in that item. That is not necessarily the case with a lot of audio content. Uh, so digitization is a way of at least preserving the content of the recording, even if the original format itself is not accessible to us. Um, there's a lot of reasons for why that might be. Um, playability, obviously, if you're here for audio digitization of it, any experience, that's a huge concern. Uh, it's increasingly difficult to get good quality cassette decks for a decent price. They are out there. Um, eBay in the secondhand market um, is really valuable for this kind of material. Um, and sometimes in a few cases, I'll talk John equipment in a little bit. Some of it I think is actually equipment we had from when cassettes were part of our kind of circulating collection and a little bit more popular. But as time goes on, those get harder and harder to get. Um, and just to kind of stray away very briefly from audio cassettes specifically, for other even older formats, that problem obviously is compounded. Um, we do a little bit of other audio digitization. Um, reel to reel is one that we work with. I wouldn't say a lot, um, but uh, we do get requests for reel to reel digitization. Those players are also very hard to find and are increasingly kind of hard to repair. So we often end up doing a little bit of like equipment preservation alongside of the actual format preservation as well. Um, cassettes, even though obviously there are some challenges there, are a little less daunting. And I do suspect that is kind of why a lot of audio digitization does tend to kind of work with cassette material, because it is a little bit more doable than some of the other formats. Um, the other concern, like it is for any kind of preservation project, is just material deterioration in the condition of the actual item. 
Uh, we have been very lucky in most of our projects. We have not had huge issues with cassettes being unplayable or in such poor condition that we couldn't work with them. Uh, so a lot of times we just do a really basic visual inspection, dust, um, you know, kind of use a pencil to kind of tighten up um, a loose tape here and there. We have not had huge issues with mold or major damage to casings. Um, so we've been very, very lucky in that regard, uh, but we are always kind of on the watch for it in case that becomes an issue. We have had a few cassettes though, where we did not realize there was kind of a mechanical issue until it went into the machine. There was nothing to indicate to us that the player was gonna kind of turn it into a pile of spaghetti. Um, so a lot of times we've been able to kind of wind the tape back and very sort of carefully in a very supervised environment with our sort of audio tech, um, been able to play it. But we have had a few where we just kind of had to say, that seems to be it. We're not going to get a, a copy of this recording um, from the look of it. Uh, and that's another thing I tell my student assistants a lot of the time. And the reason why audio digitization is sometimes very time consuming is it does play in real time and you can't leave it. Um, I would never recommend a student walk away from a tape deck while it's running, even though it kind of seems like it's sort of doing its own thing. Uh, because if you do run into an issue where a tape gets stuck or it starts to eat itself, you do need to be there to uh, hit the stop button fairly quickly to prevent further damage. So um, we'll also kind of talk about access as a preservation tool, because um, obviously if you have a digital copy of something, it takes a lot of pressure off of the original. So we just have one file. You're not constantly trying to rip a copy or have people access an original cassette tape. It also speeds up um, the kind of reference process for our special collection staff as well. Um, it's much quicker to just send a link to something in a digital repository or send a file uh, than it is to kind of set somebody up with a tape deck or do a one-off digitization request. Um, and then obviously beyond the preservation benefits and an area that we're really involved with as well is providing online access. Um, so obviously for various reasons, it's not realistic for people to be able to come in and access tape recordings um, on an actual cassette deck. So we have a, spent a lot of time obviously focusing on making this content available online. Um, and I'm going to talk about it in the context of this ongoing UPEI Archives audio collection project, um, but I will mention um, just sort of where this collection and all of our collections we're going to talk about live. Um, if people aren't familiar, um, we maintain a fairly large collection of online digital repositories of a whole bunch of different types of historical material. Donald had alluded to a few of the collections there. We've got maps, books, um, a bit of video here and there, and then a very large audio collection as well. Um, and that all lives under this islandarchives.ca umbrella. Um, so this is a collection of collections, um, but also of different standalone sites. Um, a big one we're gonna look at here today is this Island Voices repository. And this is where the bulk of our audio content sits but we're also gonna take a peek at Boeing down home. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and all of our Island Archives sites are created, managed, maintained um, by us here at the library. Um, and they all run on, probably unsurprisingly, the Islandora digital repository system. Um, I will touch a little bit further on in kind of some of our approaches and how we use Islandora to display some of the content. I will just give a note, um, Islandora is in the process of going through a fairly significant upgrade to Islandora 2. Uh, so a lot of what we're looking at today in probably the next few years is going to look and kind of work very differently. So I'll show you what we're doing now, but just keep in mind, um, we may be changing our approach in the very near future. And we've had some preliminary conversations about moving some of our, our audio content over. So I'll just sort of mention this audio tapes collection, because this is one we are in the process of doing. I think a student's actually working on it now as we speak. Uh, so this came from our archivist and special collections librarian. Um, and this is digitizing a selection of tapes from our actual in-house archival collection. So this is all lectures, events, um, town hall meeting recordings um, from the UPEI community itself. And we've been kind of doing one-off digitization requests as researchers need items um, for the past few years. So I think this has sort of been long on his list for a lot of reasons, um, both to kind of safeguard the collection itself, but also speed up the way we are able to uh, respond to those research requests. Then I also want to talk about how important community partnerships have been um, to kind of generating and kind of maintaining or 
making these projects happen. Um, this past one, we looked at that UPEI collection is an in-house collection we've always known about. Um, but PEI, Atlantic Canada in general, is full of content that we're not aware of. Um, and so forming and maintaining those community relationships and just developing a reputation that like you're looking for content to work with can be really valuable. A lot of our past projects um, were the result of people either coming to us or us being aware of a collection that's out there, forming a partnership and making something happen. So a lot of the collections that you'll see on Island Voices are not necessarily things that we maintain in house, but they belong to other people and we've worked with them to make them available. Uh, so the Benevolent Irish Society is an Irish cultural um, organization here in Charlottetown PEI. Um, and they had a whole bunch of audio cassettes of lecture recordings and oral histories that they had accumulated over the years. They were very worried that these were gonna become unplayable. And they were also very interested in making that Irish heritage available to more people. So we worked on a digitization project with them and that's now available here on Island Voices. And they are actually in the process of doing some uh, metadata enhancement for us as well. Uh, another collection I'll mention, and this is kind of one of those big keystone collections. Um, it happened a little bit before my time here at the, sorry, the university, but I do believe this was kind of the starting collection that kind of created Island Voices, and that's the Dutch Thompson collection. So Dutch Thompson, um, if anybody has not heard of him before, which if you're off island, maybe you haven't, um, is a very, very well-known folklorist and historian on the island. And he has created just this absolute massive collection of oral history interviews with older islanders, um, just talking about memories and experiences of their life on Prince Edward Island. It's an incredibly, incredibly valuable collection um, that was stored on cassette. Um, and there were some real concerns about what would happen to that as time goes on. Um, it was also the subject, um, these were played on a radio show on CBC radio called The Bygone Days that was very, very popular and they still um, play uh, clips from it um, today, kind of in the afternoons. Uh, so this was a big one that we were able to become a part of. Again, a little bit more of my time, but this has kind of set a lot of the uh, the standard and the reputation for the university um, as we've moved forward with other projects. So that's a really exciting one. We do often have a requirement when we do work with community partners that in exchange for doing the work, especially if we're doing it for free or in kind, that they are signing permissions and write-offs or releases so that we can make this available um, online um, to the public and to researchers as well, um, which is wonderful. Um, it helps build reputation for people who are looking to have more content um, digitized. Sometimes that can be a little overwhelming and it's hard to say no when you're not able to take on a community partnership. Um, but I'd rather have too much interest than not enough. And also sometimes these community partnerships come with a boost in resources. Uh, occasionally they will come to us with funding, often not the case, but sometimes there will be a little bit of money that they're able to contribute to this work being done. Sometimes it's just a matter of staffing. Um, so for example, the Benevolent Irish Society is working on, I mentioned there, um, some metadata enhancement. And that's a very time consuming process that we would not be able to do ourselves. And they're working on it. They have volunteers that we provide a training to, um, and they're doing a lot of that work. And that's been really wonderful um, that we're able to accomplish it in that way. Uh, another collection or site that I will mention is Bowen Down Home. This is a collection of fiddle music recordings and oral history around fiddling traditions on Prince Edward Island. And uh, this is actually show it to you because it's just a really beautiful site, um, really well done. This is um, the result of a number of different partnerships um, and is curated by a researcher named Ken Perlman um, from Boston, who has done an incredible amount of uh, research and recording of this and collecting of this PEI fiddle music. Because he was the curator, um, he also brought with him uh, a considerable amount of expertise, both in contextualizing the collection, um, but also providing um, a good amount of like audio cleanup um, to a level um, and kind of a degree that we probably wouldn't have been able to do on our own if it was just our in-house team doing that work. So lots of advantages to working with some of our community partners. Um, this next section, I will kind of just briefly touch on some of the technical details. Again, I'm not going to get into anything too, too heavy today, but just to give you a sense of, uh, of what we're working with. And if you do have questions, we can always follow up after if I'm not 100% sure of the answer. Uh, so uh, equipment, um, like I mentioned, it can sometimes be hard to get your hands on a good quality cassette deck. 
uh, as you can see from some of these pictures. Some of ours are a little bit older than others, but they both do the job well. Um, I have also included a, uh, a link down here to a technical bulletin from, I believe, the Heritage Information Network. And um, it kind of goes over a lot of best practices for developing um, like an equipment setup. I will say audio digitization can be a little overwhelming when you first come to it. Even myself, who's been in it for a little bit, I was reading through this technical bulletin and said, uh-oh, we might need to do a bit of an audit on our, our setup here because some of the recommendations they're making are actually technically not what we're doing. Um, and again, you can get really intense, really elaborate setups. You can also do fairly bare bones. And I'd say what we have set up here is close to like the kind of basic setup. Um, and it's just a matter of finding that balance between what you're reasonably able to do with your budget and your staffing and your capabilities. Um, and are you getting a good, good enough quality recording that you're happy with that kind of meets some of those archival standards? Uh, so, and not to get too caught up with um, kind of the perfect becoming the enemy of the good. Sometimes you just kind of have to say, yep, this is a usable recording and we're gonna go with it. Uh, I have found just as a note, um, once you have things set up, I have found a lot of student assistants take to this work and pick up the workflow a lot easier than for our book digitization. I strongly suspect some of that is just the equipment itself. Um, we do use Audacity, I'll mention that in a second. Um, and those softwares are often fairly user friendly, uh, whereas a lot of our software and equipment we use for our book and print digitization has a much, much steeper learning curve. But once you have a workflow set up, I have found students do quite well with this type of content. Uh, I will also just kind of mention as well some of our tech settings that we use when we do digitize. Obviously, all of this is sort of subject to project um, by project to project, um, but I'll just mention what we kind of do as a matter of default. Um, we do digitize and save as a WAV file. Um, there are some other recommendations, but this one has kind of served us quite well so far. And then when we push our content to Islandora, there's a whole process that happens in the background, and it also generates an MP3 access copy for us as well that it stores alongside the original archival copy in the system. Um, we record at a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz. Um, this is one of those things I may need to review because I do believe the recommendation is a little bit higher. Um, that 96 kilohertz recommendation is for like very high quality kind of complex recordings. Usually somewhere closer to 44 to 48 is okay if what you're recording is just human beings talking to one another. And that's a lot of what we've, what we've got. Um, but again, this is one of those situations where I looked at that and said, might need to review some of our things moving forward, um, just to make sure that like we're kind of keeping abreast of some of the best practices. So um, I've been learning quite a bit during this webinar. Um, and then our bit depth, um, we just use pretty standard 24 bits, and that is generally the recommendation for most recordings. Um, and I have linked down here as well, museum's how-to guide for digitizing audio. Again, this one gets into the nitty gritty a little bit, but it's a really great primer on like how to figure out the best sample rate, bit depth, file formats. It's got all kinds of estimates for um, estimating file size based on your settings and the length of the recording that can be really useful for um, storage. Uh, and lastly, before we dig too much into our next section, I will just quickly mention, and I know I had a question um, during the RSVP process for this webinar, uh, people wondering what software we use to actually pull the audio um, and do any editing and cleanup. And we use pretty exclusively Audacity. Um, if any of you have dabbled or worked in audio digitization in the past, you've probably encountered uh, this particular software. It's open source. It's incredibly well documented online. It's well supported. It's just one of those open source tools that is just, it just does what it needs to do and it does it really well. And it's relatively user friendly and their user documentation is really well done. Um, again, this is one students pick up very quickly. I think it's uh, one of those open source tools that if it ever sort of went away, a lot of us would be kind of at a loss for, uh, for a decent uh, priced replacement. Uh, a few notes, so we do use this to actually do the recording of the audio from the tape deck. Um, we do use it for any editing or cleanup that we're doing as well. Um, we don't do a whole lot of editing. Yeah, so I meant, yeah, Audacity is just, it is the best. Um, there was just a note in the chat there. Uh, yes, yeah, so we don't do a ton of editing and cleanup. Um, editing, we tend to just sort of tidy up any dead air at the beginning and end of a recording, or if there's a lot of space kind of uh, between side A and side B. 
uh, for things like noise reduction and actually um, editing the sound quality itself. Um, again, it depends on the project. If we have the resources to spend a lot of time and clean up those recordings and we have the expertise on hand to do that, we do. Um, for a lot of content, so for example, like the BIS content and that UPEI collection, um, we tend to ration how much um, editing and touch up that we do. Um, and that's uh, just because it's kind of time consuming. It's a little harder to get your head around. Um, again, our amazing digitization technician um, who does a lot of our audio work is, is very good at this type of work, but he also has a lot of other parts of his job that he needs to attend to. So we tend to kind of prioritize sort of the worst quality ones. And if we're kind of generally happy with um, with the the hearability or kind of the clarity of a recording, we'll just sort of leave it as is, and we save we save Rob for when we really need him. So that's sort of how we approach that. Um, and then obviously um, Audacity has some options for embedding metadata, and you can see kind of on our screenshot here, there's an option for a labels track as well, um, and we do use that to kind of create some of our sort of quasi transcripts, and I'll talk about that process in just a second. So that's how we sort of approach the actual getting of a file off of an analog item. Um, and lastly, I want to spend some time talking about how we approach metadata and especially transcription. So um, for our metadata, like I mentioned, Audacity does allow for embedding metadata directly into the WAVE file so that when you pull it up, it's kind of part of the properties and it's always stored alongside the WAVE. Uh, we do that sometimes. Um, it's usually pretty bare bones if we're going to. And we tend to do that kind of work, especially if we are doing some digitization where the files are not being pushed to one of our online repositories, if they are instead being um, stored on a hard drive or on a server somewhere here where they might not have a metadata record alongside of it. Um, because primarily we store most of our metadata in a separate XML file that gets uploaded to Islandora and stored alongside, uh, alongside the item. And that's where everything is sort of held together. Uh, let's see. So we use PB Core for the bulk of our audio content. Um, and PB Core, I think it stands for Public Broadcasting Core. It does come out of the public broadcasting community in the United States. Uh, and it is a cataloging standard data sharing tool and kind of much, much more, but specifically uh, geared towards audiovisual content. We primarily use it as a description standard and um, we use their XML schema to create the XML files where we store the metadata. Um, I've got just kind of a screenshot here of just some of the kind of core elements. Um, sometimes these records can get a little complex, but um, the reason for that is it allows us to store instantiation data. So we can store information, say it's a oral history interview, but the interview itself, but then within the same XML record, um, we can have an entire kind of wrapper element for data about the original recording on a cassette and then a separate wrapper element for data um, or info about the digitized version. So you have both the information for both the digital copy and the original analog copy kind of combined. Um, if we were to just use something like MODS or Dublin Core, um, we may have to, I haven't looked into how we would do that, but we would need to probably use an extension. There'd probably be some extensive use of notes fields to kind of capture that there's a difference in an item there. Um, and PB Core just sort of allows you to do that as a matter of course, which is very nice. Um, but it does mean for a fairly long, long record. Um, one thing I have noticed is because we are tracking both the date for an original item and the digitized version, um, we do need to be careful within our Islandora setup um, of how we're displaying that metadata. Most end users are not overly interested in the date that we digitized a bit of content. They're usually interested in the date of the original recording itself. Um, and so for that purposes, I usually try and make sure that it's clear when those are displayed, what people, sorry, what people are, um, are seeing, uh, but we're interested in when things are digitized. So we maintain that kind of administrative and preservation data alongside as well, even if the user's not overly interested. Okay. Oh, whoops, clicked a link instead of moved my slide forward. Here we go. So now I would like to talk about transcription. So this is an area where we've been doing some work, but we've been actively trying to improve our workflow and our approach. 
I'm very interested to see what other people's experiences have been. Uh, so full transcription of audio files, you could apply the same kind of context to video as well if you have older video material. Um, it's really valuable for like, what I'm assuming are probably obvious reasons, but I'm gonna state them just in case. Um, obviously it makes something searchable, even if it's not something you have in an online repository like our Islandora sites, um, even if it's just a text file that sits alongside a wave or an MP3 file on a computer somewhere, having something that you can kind of control F or search through to access different parts or kind of look for key terms or words um, is a really, really valuable, valuable bit of, uh, sorry, just a valuable thing to have. Um, lost my train of thought there for a second. It also helps with discoverability. So because our content is on these online repositories, it allows um, some of this content to get pulled up in a search um, in a way that it might not if we were only relying on a um, like a description or an abstract. You can't capture everything in an abstract. Um, there's obviously some accessibility uh, benefits or kind of at this point requirements as well to having a full transcript. It allows people who are not able to actually listen to the recording um, to be able to still access the information. It also just speeds up researchers' work. Um, a lot of times people might not be interested in the entirety of a recording. A lot of our interviews and stuff are pushing an hour, hour and a half, uh, sometimes two hours. Um, and so that's a lot to listen to if you're only looking for mentions of a particular name or place. Uh, so for a lot of reasons, full transcription would be great. However, um, it's very time consuming to do and it's very labor intensive if you're doing it manually. Um, and so it's, historically for us, that has not been kind of a feasible option to have a student sit there and type out an entire, entire recording and timestamp it and everything. So as kind of a middle ground to combat that, um, and this was something that was um, in place kind of as early as the Dutch Thompson collection. This was the approach they took as well. Um, we use annotations and timestamps to kind of get not a full transcript, but at least capture what's happening or what's being talked about or what's um, being brought up at different points in the recording. Uh, so this involves identifying or pulling out key subject matter changes in subject. So if we're moving from one topic to another, identifying where those topic changes happening are happening and IDing them with timestamps. Um, again, this doesn't give us full searchability or accessibility, but it does at least give users a way to quickly navigate or search through um, a recording if they don't want to listen to the whole thing. And it allows um, access points at least to um, show up in searches. Uh, and we do tend to focus mostly on things that people might be searching for or specifically interested in. So again, really common stuff like names, places, events, dates, um, main subject matter, um, stuff like that. Uh, and there's a few different ways that we've actually even approached, ways that we've approached this approach. Um, and some of that has to do with the way content is set up and displayed in Islandora. And some of it has to do with just the amount of time that we had to devote to this type of annotation work. So the first example that I'll use is the Dutch Thompson collection. Um, so within Islandora, if you're not familiar with that software, um, it works with different content types. So types of material you might be adding to the collection that controls how things are displayed, um, what the player looks like, kind of how you interact and what options we have um, for the user um, for different types of material. There's lots more to it, but for this purpose, that's kind of what we're talking about. So for this section or this collection, and for a lot of our collections, we use what probably should be fairly obvious, the Islandora audio content type. Um, and I'll just kind of show you what that looks like. Put her up here. Uh, and so what we get when we have a transcript is we've got our player here, we've got all the metadata details here. And then actually as part of the metadata, we have this annotation where I've got side A, timestamp, and then a little description of what's being talked about. Um, and I've got just an example of that here. So the reason it displays like this is we actually include the transcript as an element in the PB core metadata XML file itself. Uh, if anybody's super interested, this is the element that we add it as. Um, and then what happens is it's displayed as kind of this big block of text in the metadata display on the site. Um, there's obviously some pros and cons to this. Um, this is not the most readable thing you've ever seen. Um, it's usable. Um, it does take a little bit of you kind of have to unfocus 
or focus in your eyes a little bit and uh, kind of really dig down to find the section in the area um, that you're looking for. But again, it's searchable. It does what it needs to do. Um, and it's very easy. I shouldn't say very easy. It's still kind of time consuming to do, but it's fairly low tech, um, a low tech way to kind of do this. You basically just create, use any text editor, have a student make their notes and then add it to the metadata record when we um, create the file or upload the file to the website, um, which is very nice. Uh, you will notice these are fairly point form notes. Um, so we've got this stories of travel to Charlottetown and a function of molasses, and then just horses, molasses, candy, sugar, Charlottetown traveling. So sometimes it's a bit of a, a sentence and sometimes it's, it's kind of just like putting subject tags in. Um, again, it gets, gets to the heart of what we're looking for and it's a fairly quick way of doing these annotations. Um, and we'll contrast that a little bit with the approach taken with the Benevolent Irish Society material. And I think this is the only, one of the few or only collections that we've done this with. Um, and this uses a different island or a content type called the oral history content type. And I believe that was developed at the University of Toronto. Um, and this is done a little differently. Instead of embedding just like text into the, or not embedding, but adding kind of the text of the transcript into the metadata itself, the transcript lives in a separate XML file um, the system also will accept a file format called VTT or Web VTT, which is a captioning and a, uh, a transcript specific file format. Um, and because we do need to create this extra extra XML file, it is a little bit more work up front um, than just kind of typing things into a, a word editor or a text editor. Um, we use a combination of Audacity's labeling or track labeling feature to um, associate the annotations with a particular timestamp, we export that and then we use open refine um, to tidy up the XML file or to tidy up the data and create an XML file that will work with the system. So again, it's a little bit more time consuming, but as you can see, the result is really lovely. This is an example here and I'll open one up so you can see. Uh, we've got our player to play the audio, but then we have this lovely transcript interface that users can work with. Um, you can scroll through, uh, you can click on a timestamp and it will automatically bring you to that point in the recording. So it's a little bit more of a user-friendly environment, but there's a considerable amount of work to make that happen. Um, and we'll see in New Island Dora if that's something we can replicate. We will, uh, time will tell on that one. Um, another thing you will notice in the difference of approaches here, these annotations are significantly larger or longer than these ones. These ones kind of take a point form approach. These are much more narrative. And uh, part of the reason for that is um, the Benevolent Irish Society is doing this work themselves. They have volunteers that are doing this. They have a lot more time to sort of make this sort of a bit more narrative um, and a little bit um, just sort of more fulsome descriptions of what's happening at different points in the interview. And they felt very strongly that they wanted that level of detail and they were doing it and that's great. If we were doing it ourselves, we probably wouldn't have the time to do that, quite that level of annotating. So that's what we've been doing so far. Um, we have though, like I mentioned, we have been looking for ways of creating automated full transcripts because we really don't have time to do them manually. Um, but AI has come a long ways um, in the last few years. There's a whole bunch of different ways that you can kind of try and get the audio of what you're working with into a text format that you can add into one of these systems. Um, so I'll go, a few, go over a few things that we've tried, and then I'll talk about why we haven't actually implemented any of these so far. Uh, the first thing are um, extensions or plugins like Soundflower or VoiceMeter, or actually VoiceMeter is just a software. Um, and what these are are extensions or softwares that uh, kind of hijack your computer's audio system and feed it into a particular app. So instead of the sound coming out of your speaker, it's being fed into directly into an app like Google Docs, where if you turn on the um, speech to text feature and uh, play the audio through one of these setups, um, it'll just automatically start typing in the text. You're not gonna hear it, but it'll be pulling the audio through one of these software programs. Uh, Soundflower is a Mac product only. Um, I do get the sense from looking online, it's getting close to deprecated. So we may in the future have to look for a, uh, an alternative to that. Voice meter is um, the alternative that was recommended to me for PC because I'm not on a Mac anymore. 
the learning curve, and you can tell because this looks very complicated, is very, very steep for this one. I have repeatedly completely destroyed my audio settings and had to uninstall it entirely so that I could still attend Zoom meetings. So I'll open source software, use at your own risk because it's easy to accidentally uh, cut yourself off from your mic when you hop into a meeting. Uh, so we have tried that um, and I have, I have gotten something to come out of that, but it has not been the most successful. Um, you can also use YouTube. Uh, YouTube has a really good auto captioning feature. It has easily downloadable those VTT files that we could plug into one of our oral history items. It's got a built-in editor so you can edit and adjust timestamps and all that good stuff. And it's free, which is nice. Um, but you do need to actually create a video file to upload. So we use an open source software called OpenShot or if we have access to iMovie, we'll use that. We just create a video file using the audio track uh, and upload it. Uh, it can take a bit of time to process. Um, and obviously you would wanna be very careful about your privacy settings depending on the project so that um, you're not exposing an interview uh, to, um, to people that you're not ready to. I noticed there's a question in the chat, MS Teams captioning function. I haven't tried it yet. Um, actually in this next slide, um, I've tried kind of paid versions of captioning functions. Um, our institution is just sort of moving into MS Teams. Um, and I have heard some rumblings that that actually could be a possibility. So I'm very interested, David, to try that out or maybe hear if anybody else has tried it. Um, because again, because AI is sort of like the thing to do right now and we are seeing a lot of improvements in the softwares, there's a lot of either paid or tiered, I'm hoping maybe MS Teams could be a nice free version of this, of um, auto captioning or auto transcribing softwares. There's lots of them out there right now. Um, I've played around with a few of them. Otter AI specifically is very nice. Again, they're often very user-friendly. They're beautiful. They have all kinds of bells and whistles and features. Otter AI is really focused on um, like meeting captioning. It sounds like Teams maybe is kind of working on potentially a competitor to that. Um, it does a pretty good job of time stamping, but again, um, it is a paid service. They have like a free tier. We can have like 300 minutes free per month. So if it's not a huge project or it's kind of something you're sort of doing gradually, maybe you could kind of schedule it in to try this out. Um, and depending on the budget, maybe you have budget for project and you can actually pay for a system like this if, if you've tested it and it seems like it works. Um, because I would test these fairly carefully and the reason will become why or become clear in uh, just a moment here. Um, Happy Scribe is another one that I haven't tested as thoroughly. I kind of did a quick, quick little attempt um, in preparation here. And my experience was pretty similar to Otter AI. It's a, it's a tiered free service um, that uh, potentially, if you wanted to pay for it, you could do that. Um, and I would probably recommend reviewing terms and services um, or terms and agreements um, before you upload anything to, uh, to a server like that, uh, just in case there's anything in there you need to be aware of. Um, and just depending on the sensitivity of the audio recordings you're working with. Uh, so yeah, it's been very fun kind of playing around with a lot of those tools and kind of figuring out what's out there. Unfortunately, I've yet to find one that I'm overly happy with um, for the type of material specifically that we're working with. Um, the recording quality makes a huge difference in how well a lot of these systems are able to accurately pick up what's being said. Um, that probably goes without saying. Um, a lot of times when we're talking directly into a mic like we are today, a captioning software does a fairly decent job of kind of getting the gist of it. And like Cynthia said in the chat here, you definitely have to go clean it up, but it's kind of saving you some time typing at least. Um, for a lot of historical recordings, um, sometimes that recording quality originally is not the best, the volume is not great, or like for the BIS lectures, um, it's a recording of something that's happening in a lecture hall or like a, a big room. And so that's really hard to capture well. Um, so again, that can really affect how good that audio transcript will be. I have not tried Dragon Naturally Speaking by Nuance. Uh, Sabrina, I noticed in the chat, I, uh, I'm going to copy paste that and write it down for later though. Um, this is what I was kind of hoping would happen um, in this part of the webinar that people would have suggestions. Um, the other thing I have really noticed is um, a lot of these systems do not interpret strong regional accents particularly well. Uh, the island accent, and I would imagine this is pretty similar 
to a lot of other Canadian collections and Atlantic Canadian collections is that uh, something might work really well if I'm just speaking into it or someone has maybe a more commonly heard accent, but a lot of older islanders with a lot of an island twang really seems to baffle the, um, the AI based, based systems. Um, YouTube, for example, when you upload something to kind of auto caption it, um, it does its best to kind of guess what language is being spoken. And it often interprets it as not English, but Spanish. And again, that's just, I think it's maybe just an accent that is not as commonly, commonly heard. So it, uh, it doesn't get interpreted quite as well. However, I'm hoping that as AI progresses, maybe we'll see an improvement of that, or maybe I just haven't found the right tool. Um, and there's been some conversation in the chat here as well. Doesn't matter what auto transcription service you use, you're always probably gonna have to have a human go back and at least take a quick glance at it. The amount of human intervention after the fact is probably gonna depend on the quality of the recording and also just like who it is that's speaking. Um, what I've noticed as well is, especially with some of the oral history interviews. Um, so for example, Dutch Thompson, who is the interviewer of uh, a lot of those oral histories and island voices, when we plug a recording into one of those systems I talked about, he comes through beautifully. It does a pretty good job of picking up his voice. He's a radio man. He's got a really clear speaking voice. As soon as the interviewee starts speaking, you see a really noticeable difference in how well it picks up um, those two different voices. And some of that is just a lot of the people he's speaking to are older and maybe their voices are not as strong as they used to be, have a stronger accent. A lot of people are maybe a little bit more shy of the microphone during that time period. So they're kind of not sitting quite as close to it as he might be. So I've had all kinds of theories about why, why we've had the results that we've had. Um, so yeah, it's been a really interesting process trying to kind of figure out what's going to work for this particular context. Um, and yeah, so had a few suggestions in the chat already, but if other people have had similar challenges um, with particularly transcribing historical recordings, um, or if you have any other questions, um, I think we have a few minutes uh, before the end of the session. Um, if you would like to open up your mic, go ahead. If you'd like to ask in the chat, you can do that as well. Uh, I see your hand there, Cynthia. I just noticed Sabrina in the chat here. Um, yeah, Dragon Naturally Speaking by Nuance. So it's a paid program. Um, but you can educate it to recognize accents. I had not come across that, uh, but I'm very interested in that. So I've got that written down to kind of test out um, because that is very, uh, very attractive to me, especially if we can kind of contribute to like improving overall captioning um, and kind of contributing kind of an island, uh, island accent to that. I think it would be really, really interested in. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sabrina. That's fascinating. I do have a question about Otter. When you tried it out, because we did try it out in the past for for call webinars, mm -hmm. and um, it didn't. It seemed to be very English focused. I guess is the way to say it. It didn't seem to deal with because we do have French language sessions uh, that we do. Gotcha. I had not run into that. Um, anything that I had tested had been in English, um, but based on what I've seen of other softwares, I'm not overly. Surprised? Oh, Evan mentioned there. Otter is actually English only, so they, I guess they don't have support for other languages. So that would be maybe what's going on there. Thanks, Evan. Dragon is available in eight languages. I'm very excited to try this out. Okay. Any other questions, suggestions? give people a few minutes just for a second there and just in case they're typing away. Okay, uh, sounds like that might be everything from everyone. Um, if you do happen to have further questions or you wanted to reach out to me directly, um, my email address is right there and I will also send these slides off to Cynthia as well. Uh, so they can be shared, but uh, very happy uh, to hear from people um, and what their experiences are, or if there's anything you wanted to know more about. 
Thank you, Kelsey. And I noticed Donald just put in the chat that Google Docs voice typing has many languages supported as well. So that's a, another one to put in the toolbox. Great. Thanks, Donald. Thank you so much, Kelty. This has been wonderful. Um, yeah. It's actually helping me too with like our, <laughs> our call webinars and trying to make them as accessible and 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 uh, as possible. Uh, so I, I learned a lot, and I there are some softwares I want to go try out now. Great. <laughs> um, Excellent. Yeah. So just thank you. Yeah. Just a reminder that we will be posting the the recording on the call website and the YouTube channel very soon. And I'll also be posting healthy slides and you will be notified once the recordings are up there. And I also like to thank the call uh, CBPA Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee, who are the uh, basically the sponsors or the hosts of today's session with Kelty. Um, thank you very much, everybody.